Good morning and welcome to our online service. We have a couple of intimations to share with you. The first of these is from Cath Day Centre in Perth. We've had an email from Jacqueline Kelly who's their support worker and she says she would like to thank us on behalf of Cath's Day Centre and service users for the very kind donation of food. So they thank us for the support for the work that they do. It's very much appreciated and they've asked if we can pass on the thanks to the whole congregation. So thank you from them. The second intimation is that um, for those of you who were in church last week or who have heard from someone who was in church last week, we were hoping to be able to hold an outdoor service at Murray Cemetery on Remembrance Sunday. However, we have since received a notification from the Church of Scotland following the revised guidance from Scottish Government, which was released on Thursday, the 29th of October. And we are no longer able to hold an outdoor service at Murray. However, we will be running the Remembrance Service service in the church next Sunday on the 8th of November and this will commence for those who are able to attend at 10.50 a.m. as planned so that we can hold a two minute silence at 11. So anybody who is hoping to come could you please phone Helen and confirm your place with her and um, she will um, do her best to make sure that we can get as many people who would wish to come as possible. The third one is that we are delighted to have Reverend Ewan Gilchrist with us again this morning and Ewan will be leading us in worship today. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome from my kitchen table to perhaps your kitchen table or your living room as we share this online service for the people in parishes of Errol, Enkelspindy and Reid. Our worship theme this morning is Interruptions and the Kingdom, because it seems that you really can't get one without the other. But firstly, let's begin with a prayer of adoration. Let's pray. How often, Lord, do we meander and stray in our prayers, losing our way in a dozen distractions, jumbled thoughts, tripped over sentences, carefully rehearsed churchy words sounding hollow on our lips. And yet we pray. We pray with a heartfelt longing, a confused yet honest opening of our innermost being. We pray, perhaps, because we are not satisfied with Mortality, for all its wonderful textures and shades, microscopes and molecules help us to understand, but they do not define us, cannot explain us. Perhaps we pray because love and laughter, music and melody point us beyond horizons, beyond analysis. Perhaps we pray because sometimes it leaves us with a peace that no formula, no equation, no test tube could ever dispense. Perhaps, Lord, we pray because it's the only way for the song to be sung, the only way for the pain to be released, the only way for a speck of dust to dream dreams of greatness. And why would we dream, O Holy Creator, unless such dreams are woven in eternity and our spirits are birthed by heaven itself. Forgetful and fretful children of God that we are, nevertheless we come now into your mysterious presence. Please bless us, name us, inspire us to serve your kingdom which your Son has revealed, inspire us to share and live the words which he has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning is one of Jesus' best-known parables, the parable of the Good Samaritan. But we're reading a slightly different version of it. It's from Jamie Stewart's The Glasgow Gospel. The Good Samaritan One day, an expert lawyer tried to trick Jesus. He said to him, Master, I'm keen to have this everlasting life that God has promised. How do I get it? Jesus said, You have the answer right there in your law book. My friend, what does it say? And the lawyer replied, You've got to love the Lord God with your whole heart, soul, mind and strength. And you've got to love your neighbour as well as you love yourself. No bad, said Jesus. Just do that and you'll please God. But the lawyer wasn't content with that and asked again, Aye, but just exactly who is my neighbour? Jesus decided to illustrate his meaning with a wee story. One day, he said, a man was travelling along a dangerous road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Suddenly, some ruffians laid into him, whipped all his gear and clays and left the poor soul half dead. Now, a Jewish priest happened to be gone down that same road. He sees the man lying there, turns his head and gives him a nifty body swerve. In the same way, a Le- Levite comes on the scene, offers no help and just leaves the poor old punter lying there. Finally, a Samaritan comes along the road. He sees the man and is touched with pity. He goes out to him kneels down and cleans his wounds. Then he puts him on his own donkey and fixes him up at the nearest inn. He looks after him during the night and in the morning squares up with the innkeeper, promising to look on in his way back. Jesus then turned to the lawyer. Knew then, which one of the three was a neighbour to the wounded traveller? Ach, dead easy, said the lawyer, the man that was kind to him. Jesus answered, Right then, Jimmy, just you do the same. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Some weeks ago, late on a Saturday evening, all was snoozy in our household as we followed the latest episode of some Nordic crime drama that had a bigger body count than a St Johnson home match. And then our evening was interrupted, and very inconvenient it was. The phone rang, and it was our local minister, wondering if I had a dog collar she could borrow, because the next day's service, barely twelve hours away, involved the boys' brigade doing a dramatic retelling of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And as one of the protagonists in the oft-told tale is a priest, albeit Jewish, she wondered if this junior thespian could borrow a dog collar to look the part. I found a spare one gathering dust somewhere, got it to Mance early the next morning, and last I heard that particular service had gone down just fine. Now I said that my evening was interrupted, but that's not really true. I I have time to spare these days. It was our minister's evening which had been interrupted, as she scurried about, fixing this, fetching that, arranging the next thing. It's just the way it is in a Mance. The word interruption gets a bad press. It has a whingy factor about it, a wasp in the mouth irritation. There I was, doing this, going there, being busy, being relaxed, enjoying myself, when I got interrupted. There I was, happily tinkering in the garden, making the meal, watching the film, when this happened. And whatever this is, it's already clear it's an interruption, and it's not welcome. All of which is understandable, 
But if we're serious about being disciples, if we're serious about following in Christ's footsteps, we need to look afresh at interruptions. After all, since most of us were knee-high to a low-flying midget, we have listened to this story of the parable of the Good Samaritan, and it's really a story about how several people did not want their carefully laid plans to be interrupted or inconvenienced, so they walked on by. And it's also a story about how one person was willing to allow his day, his plans, his timetable to be interrupted in the name of human compassion. And he stopped to care for a beleaguered and beaten up fellow traveller. Now maybe the next time that scripture is read in our kirk, it should be introduced as a parable of the interruption, or even better, why not call it the parable of the very poor time manager? Because this is all about what we do with our time, how we manage it. Years ago, my kirk session eagerly sent me to a conference which was all about time management. Perhaps they were hoping their minister would be able to make more house calls if his diary was less chaotic. Anyway, I arrived late at that conference and had to leave early. Not a word of a lie there. Ironic for a course on time management, but a parish funeral had cropped up, and I honestly didn't think the bereaved and distressed family would find much comfort in me saying, I'll be with you in four days. Don't worry. Granddad's not going anywhere. So I got to this conference on time management late, and I had to leave early. But the bit in the middle was really very outstanding, and one particularly interesting bit I'm sharing with you now, because this little sermon isn't about how ministers work. It's about how Jesus works. The speaker simply said, next time you're beating yourself up because you've got to the end of the day, and you haven't achieved half the things you set out to achieve, just remember that Jesus' ministry was a ministry of interruptions. And he went on to quote several incidents in the Gospels, exactly reiterating that truth. Jesus was walking to Jericho when interruption, or Jesus was on his way to such and such a place when interruption, or Jesus was sharing a meal with friends when interruption. And it was suddenly crystal clear to me that so often in the life of Jesus, the kingdom is revealed in the course of an interruption. He's going from A to B when he's confronted by a desperate father seeking help for his son, or a centurion, one of the enemy, asking help for his servant, or a humiliated woman is thrown before him by a crowd of knuckle-dragging stone-throwers who like nothing better than old-fashioned justice for adulterers, the female variety preferably. And it's how Jesus reacts to these interruptions that reveal that the kingdom of God really is all about justice and joy, all about mercy and grace, and all about challenge and choice. It's especially about choice. I don't know about you, but for myself, even in retirement, I like to have a game plan for the new day. I wake up, I think, well, no deed yet, and that means there's a whole new shiny day lying ahead of me. And I've got plans for that new day, a mixture of duties and pleasures, grand plans and minor chores, obligations and inclinations, but it is a plan. Just as I had a plan for every day I was working in the parish, the fact that those plans very rarely got accomplished isn't really important. I think it makes sense to at least have some sort of plan at the beginning of each day. And depending on who you are, and what stage of life you're at, and what job you do, that plan can cover all manner of scenarios. For some it means walking the dog, ironing the school shirts, making up the lunch boxes, doing the school run. It's not even 8.30 yet. For others, it could mean clocking in at the office, making the mid-morning conference, looking in on the afternoon team meeting, filtering a tsunami of emails, and finding a way to meet impossible deadlines. For someone else, it might be a gentler day, tinkering in the vegetable patch, deadheading the Livingston daisies, lifting the dahlias, and stocking the freezer with pizza and ice cream because the marauding grandchildren are coming. 
what matters is that for every one of us, and no one who calls themselves a Christian is exempt from this, what matters is that whatever plans we lay down for the day, we need to remember that sometimes there will be interruptions. And sometimes those interruptions, inconvenient and pressurizing as they probably are, how we respond to them may become the critical moment in our about-to-be-messed-up day, because it could be the moment when the kingdom comes, the moment when we let something of the grace of God be seen through us for the blessing of others. And what might those interruptions be? What might they look like? Well, uh, here's a few. A phone call from the school saying that daughter number two has a temperature and needs to be collected. Difficult, complicated, because mum and dad are already at work. Or your car is puttering patiently at the traffic lights. You've checked your watch. You know you're on time for that important meeting. You see a jogger coming down the road, pausing at the curbside. And then, suddenly, they collapse. Or you're so looking forward to watching the latest Wimbledon final, where a 65-year-old Roger Federer is playing an Iron Bruce sponsored and mechanically rebuilt Andy Murray. And just as it's about to start, a friend phones, and it becomes clear that she wants to talk. She needs to talk. Now. Or you've just got home from a very bad day at the office. And you just want to make it to the kitchen, find a cold beer and unwind. But that's when you notice that the removal van has just drawn up next door. You know that means the new neighbours have arrived. And you're smart enough to know, and thoughtful enough to know, that a word of welcome now could mean a great deal. And it would mean a lot less in a week's time. But you've just had a hell of a day. Every person here could add half a dozen scenarios to that list. All I'm saying is that it's good to have a plan when God gives us a new day. But it's even better to know when that plan has to be ditched, and perhaps salvaged later, because something has happened that wasn't on anyone's agenda. And how we respond to that moment, that interruption, that inconvenience, that just might be the moment when the prayer that we say so often, that we said earlier this morning, Thy kingdom come, Lord, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven, that just might be the moment when heaven's grace flows through your life and mine, and others will be blessed because we were prepared to be inconvenienced. Of course, the trouble with inconvenience and interruptions is that there's often a mess to be tidied up afterwards. Undone tasks still need done, and there's pleasure surrendered which may or may not be retrieved later. But that's not the point. The point is that Jesus' ministry was a ministry of interruptions. It changed the world. It's how heaven was revealed on earth. And we could do a lot worse than imitate some of Jesus' thinking and some of Jesus' acting. And if, some days, at the end of your day, at the end of my day, when you sigh and see only the things that you didn't get done, pause a moment longer. Maybe in that day, almost finished, there have been interruptions. You'd almost forgotten about them. But maybe when those interruptions happened, you didn't walk on by. Maybe then that was when the grace of God was glimpsed in your life and in mine. So glory be to God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning and is now and ever shall be. Amen. Our prayers of intercession are led for us now by Lorna. Let us pray. Loving Lord, as the seasons change and we move from autumn into winter, with all its red and gold beauty, we offer you our thanks and praise. We remember and hold before you people in your world where the fading of light brings not only darkness, but sadness and discomfort, 
may they know your light. When we're able to gather and share food and laughter with friends, relatives and those whom we love, and also when we're content to eat alone, we offer you our thanks and praise. We remember and hold before you those who today will share meals tainted with sadness, those who through no choice of their own eat alone, those who are hungry and have little food, may they soon know joy and plenty. When we have been offered hospitality that was generous or unexpected, we have been blessed, and we offer you our thanks and praise. We remember and hold before you refugees and those who are strangers in a foreign land, those for whom exceptional warmth and hospitality would mean so much. May they know a rich welcome and ongoing support. When someone who knows us a little, but not well, remembers our names, we offer you our thanks for their care and attentiveness. We remember and hold before you those who have been forced to change their names, or those who forget their names, the overseas student in a culture that feels alien, those who have been trafficked, those living with dementia. May they know liberation and freedom. And hear us too as we take time to remember and hold before you those caught up in the current pandemic in the terror attacks that are happening in France and pray for those in the presidential elections in the US. Minister to their needs, we pray. Ever creating, ever loving, ever encouraging God, we offer you our deep thanks Use our gifts, talents and skills in the world so that our lives may tell out your praise and where possible and those whom we remembered before you today. Hear our prayers through Jesus Christ, our loving Saviour. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God be with you, the strength of the Father, the companionship of the Son and the peace of the Spirit be with you and with those who are precious to you, this day and always. Amen.